to uh, introduce our moderator. This is Dr. John Shook. He is the Vice President for Education Research and Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Inquiry in Amherst, New York. He is also a Research Associate in Philosophy at the University of Buffalo. Um, his latest book is The God Debates, a 21st Century Guide for Atheists and Believers and Everyone in Between. There's more information on the book outside. Well, good evening, and thank you very much for coming out tonight. I think it's going to be a fascinating evening. We have two marvelous debaters with us tonight. It's my honor to introduce them both, and then I'll briefly describe the debate, debate format that's going to go on until about 8.15, at which point you'll be able to ask your questions. There are two microphones here, and we'll just simply take as many questions as we can, switching back and forth between the microphones, indicate who you're addressing your question to, and be sure you're asking a question as briefly as possible. It is my additional honor to cut anyone off who uh, seems to be giving a speech, but I'm sure that will happen. Uh, tonight's format is all about morality. How do we define morality? Do people need God to be moral? If not, where do our morals come from? Are good works uh, just behavioral, or biological, or biblical? What does it mean to be human? And can a person be fully human without God? Our two speakers tonight are Matt Dillahunty and Father Hans Jacobsey. Matt Dillahunty is the president of the Atheist Community of Austin in Texas. He is host of the popular public access television and internet show called The Atheist Experience. He was raised as a fundamentalist Baptist, and he was on track to become a minister until he started asking questions about the reasons for his belief. He rejected religion and now serves as public voice for rationality and secular morality. Father Hans Jacobsey is an Antiochian Orthodox priest. He administers the website Orthodoxy Today, and he heads the American Orthodox Institute. Father Hans is convinced that Orthodox Christianity has an important part to play in the American moral renewal. He views the current world as a battle between competing moral visions of the secular and the sacred. And he hopes that Christianity can restore the moral traditions of the Gospels. Please welcome our speakers. Finally, um, uh, an, a, a sketch of uh, the, uh, the format tonight, and then uh, we'll get started. Each speaker will have 10 minutes to make their opening remarks and uh, statement of their position. Then each will have five minutes to react directly to what the other has said in their opening address. Then there will be a brief period where each will have an opportunity to address some new question that has occurred to them to the other, and the other may reply, and then we'll switch. The other one will ask a question, and the first one will reply. That'll go fairly briefly, because we're going to then proceed to a final closing statement by each of five minutes, and I have cards here to remind them when they need to be done. At about 8.15, the formal debate will be over, and then, as I said, we'll proceed to the question and answer. So let's get started. The first speaker, by Toss of the coin is Matt Dillamenti, who now has 10 minutes to make his opening remarks. Thank you all for attending. Um, I, I'm not going to waste a whole bunch of time thinking, but I really do appreciate the fact that everybody came out for this and the, the groups that got together to put this event on. Morality is often an overwhelming and complicated topic, and I think personally that this need not be the case. It's often muddled by seemingly insoluble moral dilemmas. And this is unlikely to change in the near future, and I have no illusions about being able to solve this problem tonight, even if either one of us fundamentally changes our position at the end of the debate, and how likely is that? What we're talking about tonight, though, is the source of morality. From what do we derive our values, and by what method do we make moral assessments? This sort of cuts to the heart of the issue and allows us to spend less time debating perhaps specific moral dilemmas and more time investigating the common ground and where we differ and why, and is there any potential solution to this? 
And actually, the topic isn't the source of morality. It was listed as the source of human morality. And uh, when I was first told this, I immediately latched onto that distinction and planned uh, to point out that humans aren't the source of porpoise morality or dog morality, and therefore I was going to claim victory by the human adjective in front of it, that clearly humans are the source of, of human morality. Uh, and I realized very quickly uh, that not only was this wrong and incorrect, but that I had uncritically stepped into a trap of a hidden assumption that leads directly to moral relativism. And I am not a moral relativist. It's important to recognize those sort of types of errors, to identify where we make assumptions and where we buy into things that we probably shouldn't, where we have colored the nature of the question such that we cannot reach an accurate answer. There is no human morality. There is only morality. Morality is an all-encompassing because there is nothing that cannot be assessed with respect to values. That assessment results in labeling something moral, immoral, or amoral. And the source of morality, I say, is reason. When I speak about morality, I'm referring to the method by which we derive and apply our values, both the core values and what we do with them. I spent the past five years discussing this subject and others on the TV show and podcast, but for the past year or so, I've been traveling the country speaking at universities and secular groups, Specifically, uh, the title of the topic, which I don't know, some of you may have seen that particular lecture, was the superiority of secular morality. In that time, I've run across frequent objections to secular morals, and I thought this might be a good time to quickly address just two of the more common ones. The first is this idea that secular morality borrows from religious morality, and it takes one of two forms. The first is that secular moral systems are simply recognizing some innate moral compass ostensibly put in there by God. Um, and that's a nice assertion, but I'd argue that any internal moral compass that we have is a function of our position as both reasoning and empathetic creatures. And that it is, in fact, religion that co-ops the natural uh, aspect of humans and adds to it this idea by means of explaining something that they, at the time, perhaps did not understand, why we are the way we are. And while that's a nice assertion, and there's a possibility that it could be true, that is something that actually needs to be demonstrated. The second form that this argument often takes is that morality has, uh, has traditionally fallen within the purview of the religious elite or the schools of religious thought. Um, and I, I find that argument just ineffectual because we are very much a species that builds off of what we've learned. So what does it matter if we learn things from religious individuals? Great thinkers, there have been great thinkers in many different categories, but the fact that a great thinker about morality happened to be religious is no more a testament to the truth of their religious assertions than that a great thinker in the field of astronomy happened to also be religious. The information that they come by does not point necessarily to inspiration from some external source. The second big objection to uh, secular morality that, that I get presented with is this issue that there is no external authority. This often comes in the form of a common sense argument, as in, you cannot be good without God. But the more robust versions assert that secular moral systems have this seemingly terrifying problem of having no definitive authority. Each individual's conscience supposedly dictates what they consider right or wrong, and secular systems wind up with competing claims and no clear resolution. I argue that this is exactly the situation that we have with religious moralities. The claim, by the way, that there are no easy solutions if there's no external authority seems entirely backward to me. First of all, why should we seek a method that's easy? Shouldn't we be seeking a method that's right? Shouldn't we be seeking a method that leaves the truth? Easy answers are not always the right ones. The fact that morality is complicated and requires thought and effort doesn't mean that we should opt for an easier solution just to save ourselves time. What we have are competing religious ideas about morality between religions and within religions. Christian morality, Muslim morality, Buddhist, Jain, Jewish. And without a given religion, or within a given religion, take Christianity for example, we have competing claims from within that religion. Clergy are not of any one mind about what their God want and often can't agree on how to interpret the messages of their sacred texts or the inspiration that they claim to get, especially when dealing with moral, moral dilemmas that aren't explicitly covered by the text, and sometimes even when they are. 
until some god actually comes forward and clearly and plainly informs everyone of exactly what its moral views are. We can't know. How could we know? Everything else is just pretense. And if some god actually does come forward and clearly and plainly inform everyone as to what its moral views are, what makes those views right? This has been addressed by the Youth Program Dilemma and many objections, um, and the truth of the matter is that the individuals advocating religious moralities make two major unsupported assumptions. The first is that a God exists, and the second is that this God is perfectly moral. They're convinced that this solves a problem, though the solution cannot exist until the premises are demonstrated to be true. The dirty little secret here is that even if these were true, they're still irrelevant because we're the ones making decisions about what we consider moral, immoral, or amoral. Now, this, this isn't a statement about each individual's opinion. This is just about the, the scope. We cannot do this beyond our ability to comprehend. It would, I contend, be immoral to hold any being responsible beyond its ability to comprehend. We generally already understand this. We teach our children, and we apportion responsibility in accordance with their comprehension. Would it not similarly be immoral, wrong, for some more advanced being who has supposedly has a better moral understanding than us to hold us accountable to standards that we cannot comprehend? Clearly, there must be a demonstration of efficacy with regard to path to truth. We're talking about morals. We're talking about what's right and wrong. We are making statements about reality, and we are making statements that are truth statements, that have some value. Why do we teach our children? Because we understand that reason is the source of morality. I'm going to run short on time in order to get all this in. Um, there's a, a section in the talk that I've given before where I contrast secular value systems and religious value systems. And I'll skip past that other than to say that the distinction is that one is internal and the other is external. One is about uh, the uh, data and results driven and the other is about coercion, about convincing by means other than data, by an element of faith or whatever. That one is a robust system that is built as we progress and the other is generally pre-built and incomplete we are left on our own. Morality, if it's to mean anything, deals with how thinking beings interact and the impact their actions have on one another. These assessments can and should be the result of exploration, investigation, evidence, much thought, and healthy debate. Advocates of religious morality like to pretend that religious morality solves problems that plague secular moral systems. Not only are these problems not solved, they're not problems. Morality does not require a definitive external authority. It is the natural product of thinking, empathetic beings trying to survive and thrive while sharing resources. It is a truth to be discovered, not a rule to be disseminated. We have the tools we need and we should continue to use them. We have a brain. We have the ability to reason. We have the ability to assess the consequences of our actions. We have the ability to look at and compare what values we hold with respect to the results those values deliver. And when we find that the, either the core values are in conflict or that the results of any given core value is in conflict with desired results from other core values, we can then rewrite the core values. This is exactly what has happened. Many religious individuals and groups have modified their personal sense of morality away from the foundations of their religion, which in most cases remains unchanged, and they've realigned themselves with the values encouraged by secular progressives. They have, for all intents and purposes, adopted the views of secular systems of morality while clinging to the traditional foundation, rationalizing the conflict away with personal interruptions. They have, in a very real sense, adopted the secular moral system as a new external source for their morality. Christian Fellowship and the Secular Student Alliance for inviting me here today. And I'm looking forward to a healthy and a very vigorous debate and a question that's not only academically interesting, but I think one of the central questions of our age. We live in what some people call a post-Christian or a post-modern society, an assessment that I think is generally true. 
but like most other sweeping claims, one, they can mean different things to different people. It's prudent then, I think, that in order to make our discussion as beneficial as possible, we first define our terms. The question we are discussing this evening is, can there be morality without God? No. Of course, I argue no. There can't be. But before giving, me, before giving my reasons, let me rephrase the question more in line with which is what I think the fundamentalist atheist presupposition. Atheism, properly understood, allows for no objective existence of anything non-material, not made from matter. Philosophical materialism is the philosophical ground of atheism, a point that anyone familiar with more than the surface character of the atheist claims will recognize as true. As such, it should be noted that atheism is a relatively recent phenomenon, at least the variety we speak of this evening, and as um, I think anyone, as I said, with a basic familiarity with the question will confirm. And it is recent because philosophical materialism, some people call it scientific rationalism or naturalism, is itself a relatively recent phenomenon. I would argue as a historian that atheism cannot exist except in a Christian society. I would argue that. It's actually an outgrowth of our Christian heritage. So, in the interest of clarifying the question, let me ask it this way. Does atheism acknowledge the independent existence of the transcendent? Put aside the term God for the moment, okay? It's too, right now it has too much surplus baggage, especially in the, in the prevalent cultural debates. When we, when we say God, let's talk right now in, in terms of transcendent, because the point I'm making is not a religious point, it's a philosophical point, and it's this. Does atheism even acknowledge the independent existence of the transcendent or any being or even principle apart from matter, apart from that which can be quantified using the tools of science? The answer, at least if the atheist is true to his premises, must be no. Just so you understand, that's, I'm not making a moral judgment on that at all. Okay? It's, it's not a moral judgment, so don't read that into my words. What I'm doing is, is, is trying to draw a philosophical distinction that I think is true. Now, does this mean that the atheist himself is immoral? Of course not. It doesn't mean that at all. There are plenty of moral atheists. It does mean, however, that the atheist, despite his embrace of moral principles and sometimes even his passionate defense of moral positions, and which even I, as a Christian, would say are the right positions, the atheist and I can be co-laborers on some issues if we both agree and, and, and decide that what we're fighting against is indeed an injustice. We can go to war together even if he draws his principle from a different source than I do. Okay, So it's not saying that the atheist is immoral. Don't make that mistake. So. Um, but, but despite the passionate defense, despite the depth of conviction, you cannot say, philosophically speaking, that the, the, the depth of that moral principle he's following is anything greater than either private conviction or social convention. No transcendent reference no authority beyond the atheist's own conviction besides the rightness of some action over others exists, philosophically. Philosophical materialism, the notion that all reality is grounded in matter, does not allow for that. From the view of what holds to transcendent causes then, which would be me, and in my case, the God of Abraham, understood within the framework of Orthodox Christianity. That a definition of reality cannot be reduced to matter alone. That matter is not the source of what defines and shapes our ideas of meaning, aesthetics, justice, and so forth. The atheist might indeed hold moral views in congruent to my own. In fact, might even be 
moral, more moral of a person than I am. It could be. But the value he places on the one moral act over another is necessarily derivative, which is to say dependent of, on a view of the universe of nature and reality that is not its own. Atheists take umbrage at that statement, and I can understand why. They get offended when I state that their moral views are derived from the categories and grammar of the tri Christian moral tradition. And necessarily so, because the Christian moral tradition has shaped what we know of Western culture. If an atheist says, for example, that killing is wrong, he's not drawing from the first principles of his philosophy. He is borrowing from the precept first delivered in the text of Christian scripture, the narrative of Moses descending from the mount, which indicates to us that precept, although it is given to us through the mouth of Moses, and thus within human conflict that Matt describes, I don't deny that at all, I never would, he's right about that, is, has a source and origin in the God of Moses which is to say that it has a transcendent source and origin, something beyond the mere molecules that made of Moses, if you will, or even the molecules of the text that gives us the story. One could argue, of course, that non-Christian cultures also recognize that killing was wrong, and I would agree with this point. There is no disputing that. But the point here is not that Christianity has an exclusive claim on moral truths. They don't. But even, but that even other religions still recognize what I consider an elementary fact of the universe. Man cannot live by bread alone, which is to say man is more than the molecules that shape his body. These religions, like Christianity, reject the materialist claim that all that exists is matter, that which can be quantified. One final point, and I don't know how to um, reconcile this with, with the atheist claim. I really don't, and I think this is one area of, of great divergence, is that I believe that truth is a category of existence, a transcendent category of existence, which is to say truth exists apart from any, any comprehension that I may have of it. Okay, follow me here. I believe that truth is a category of existence, a transcendent category of existence, which is to say that truth exists, exists apart from my con comprehension or understanding of it. I may think that I know the truth. Maybe I really even know what is true. But my belief in what is true does not bring that truth into being. In other words, truth exists independent or whether or of whether or not I believe in it, just as light exists independent of my ability to see it. True, if I am blind, I don't experience the light. It has no effect in me. But the light nevertheless exists. I'm not saying, I'm not sure how the, the atheist can assert the existence of any enduring truth. The best he can do, I think, is assert that truth has a pragmatic character. And with that, I would agree. It just happens to be what most people believe, rightly or wrongly, and its effect is dependent not on any objective existence, but dependent on the depth of belief by what they believe is indeed the truth. The atheist is correct in this, of course. I won't, I won't deny that. I won't argue with that but not completely, and that's my point, which is to say that the truth, and thus morality, can never escape a kind of continuous relativism in the atheist paradigm, imprisoned, that is, to the shifting winds of the day. Thank you. Uh, now Matt has five minutes for a direct response. I didn't have anything else written. No. Um, that's a lot to uh, think about. Um, I'm not I'm not actually sure um, that we disagree on, on one element. I've actually had a lengthy debate on the transcendental argument of the existence of God and shocked um, the opposition by agreeing with the initial points about the nature of logical absolutes. Um, so when it comes to truth, 
I, I don't know that we're necessarily on completely different pages. I will say, though, that the idea that uh, uh, the derivative nature of morality to say that we would not know killing is wrong had it not been delivered uh, purportedly to Moses um, is, is something that I, and not to be offensive, but I just find it absurd. As if somebody needed, I mean, did, did these people before God delivered that to Moses, did they not understand the consequences of killing another person and how that might be wrong? The idea that people could not comprehend that our actions have consequences and those consequences have more consequences, that we don't live in a vacuum, that what I do affects each and every one of you. And the, the, you know, we, we understand this when it comes to ideas about liberty, where the right to swing my arm is at your nose type of thing. But what we have to understand is that as you need nothing more than multiple individuals trying to share resources and subsisting together, any interaction in order to reach these conclusions. It, it is, it is, I, I just, I, the idea that people couldn't have realized that killing was wrong. I mean, I mean, I would argue that even the Bible contradicts that, in that when Cain slew Abel, clearly he knew it was wrong. This was long before anything had been delivered to, to Moses, and I'm, I'm sure that there is, you know, some internally consistent response to that. But cultures independent of the ancient Israelites had come to these you know, conclusions on their own. Now, where, where they put on the timeline um, is you know, up for debate. Um, and I'm not a historian, so I won't even address that. Um, when we're talking about truth and the fact that truth has to exist independent of our knowledge of it, yes, that's true. And in a metaphorical sense, I have no idea, I have no objection to the idea of, of a transcendent category of existence um, or, or something along those lines. I will agree um, that light, which is, you know, physical, um, agrees independent of our ability to actually observe it. And if every mind in existence right now ceased to exist, this podium, as far as we can tell, as the reason would lead us to believe it, it would still be what it is. There would be nobody to observe it. And when we discover things in the universe, this is a process of inquiry and investigation, but we have discovered something. Um, and the, the, the existence of that thing is independent of our ability to perceive it or understand it. I mean, it's not like you didn't exist before we, we met today. Um, and I would think that it would be preferable to view this nebulous idea of truth as an emergent property of the natural state of the universe, much in the same way that we can view consciousness as an emergent property of the brain, um, or wet as an emergency, as an emergent property of water. How many molecules do you need before you have wet? What is wet? This is this is this is something that's incredibly difficult to grasp, and then that's not just a pun. I mean, the idea of how much of this do you need? The the sand paradox: how many grains of sand do you have to pull before there's not a pile? The pile is conceptual. Wet, though, is not conceptual. Wet is a physical interaction, and that's the key. That what we're talking about when we talk about morality is the interaction. And my contention is that you need nothing more than any two individuals who are interacting, who are thinking, reasoning beings, empathetic to one another, understanding the consequences of their action, to develop a moral system. It's not difficult to determine that life is generally preferable to death, Pleasure is generally preferable to pain, and that there are exceptions to these, particularly when those core values or those core foundational points interact. That it may be a case where death may be preferable to life when pain is so much greater. I don't know. I'm not here to necessarily assert moral positions on when euthanasia might be allowed or if it's ever allowed. I'm saying that those values arise as emergent phenomena in the interactions of thinking beings. say killing is wrong because uh, we know killing is wrong because um, Moses came down from the mountain. And understand that as narrative. Okay? I'm not a biblical literalist. I'm not a fundamentalist at all. But I do, do believe that narrative is the ground of culture. I don't even believe philosophy is the ground of culture. Okay? And I'm not a historian. 
historicist, although I love history. I believe that narrative is the ground of culture. And I believe that truth enters the world through a word when it's spoken. In the beginning, God spoke the world into existence. That's my presupposition. Okay, and I'll tell you that. And that's why I think debates like this are very, very important. And killing is not wrong because the narrative says that God disallows killing. Okay? I think I agree with Matt in some fundamental ways, but we, we, we end up in a different place. I think that, that in in the 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 astonishing, astonishingly complex and often tragic interaction between human beings, certain moral principles can be distilled. I agree with that 100%. And that's why I also believe that, that sometimes morality is unclear. What we believed yesterday might not exactly hold today. But there are some fund foundational and fundamental truths that I think are so self-evident even to those who believed in gods other than the God of Abraham, or those who believe in no gods at all, that they can still be discerned. I have no problem with that. I think that's why you see similarities in different religions. I think that's why the atheists, I still hold to the fact that the atheist can make no ultimate tr transcendent appeal beyond his own personal authority, which is to say beyond his own experience, even the atheist can still discern some of these fundamental precepts. They're written into the very fabric of the universe, number one, speaking as a Christian. Number two, they're corroborated in the interactions with people. But what I'm talking here is where is the fundamental authority, where is the fundamental seal that says, yes, this violates the ultimate moral prohibition. This is a moral line that ought not to be crossed. Here's the problem that I have with atheism, not with Matt. I like a lot of what Matt says, actually, a whole lot. I think, I, well, I could go up to, I could go grab a beer with Matt. I really could. <laughs> I could. I really could. And we could enjoy it. We'll just put the God question aside. How's that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, um, the problem is, is, is that the atheist experiment especially in this last century. I don't hold him responsible. I don't hold a lot of atheists responsible, so I'm not making a moral judgment here. Please understand me. The problem is, is that the atheist experiment, especially with eugenics and, and, and communism and so on and so forth, I'm not saying that all atheists are eugenicists. I'm not making that. But the real reason those moral lines were crossed and the, the corrective to the crossing of those lines did not come from within atheism, but from outside of it. It's because it cannot, it cannot and does not hold any other claim to authority besides its own experience. Now, Matt said that truth is an emergent property of the universe. That's a very, very recent claim, okay? I, I hold to an older tradition. And that is that truth exists in the universe, but it needs to be uncovered. It doesn't emerge. Now, that's not to say that Christians, all Christians, did truthful things. Clearly, some did not. And it's not to say that what we hold as true is necessarily as developed as it might be. But it does say that truth is not emergent and contingent on our own experience, but it, again, and make the trans, transcendent argument, that truth as a separate category of being actually sits in judgment of what we do. It doesn't follow that someone who says, I have the truth, does indeed have the truth. That doesn't follow. When someone says, I have the truth, they go, oh yeah, let's see. I'll listen, I'll think. Okay, and I expect to be challenged in the same way. It does say that truth as a, cat, as a separate category of being, okay, requires, in the end, our wrestling with it and submission to it. Now, here's where I, I differ with the atheist, is that I don't believe either. Perhaps 30 more seconds. Oh, 30, oh sorry, I wasn't watching, okay. Um, Truth, I think, too, has a, 
it's, it's not only, I talk of it as a um, category of being, but I also think that truth has a personal dimension. I'm a Christian. But truth is not something you see. Truth is something first you hear. Now we enter a short phase where each may ask a question of the other, perhaps of clarification or expansion, uh, perhaps a bit of creative thinking, because uh, somebody might have heard a twist or a wrinkle that, that hadn't been heard before. So uh, we'll continue on in this phase uh, with Matt asking the first question, and then the father will uh, answer, and then the father will ask a question, and we may peter out at that point and go to closing. We'll see how, uh, how thick this gets. We want to make sure there's as much time for individuals in the audience to ask questions as possible because, I mean, we could go talk about this over beer, but I can't take everybody for beer. <laughs> and I'm fine with your extra 30 seconds since I interrupted you for a joke, which reminded me that I forgot the joke about me being on the dark side of the podium. Oh, yeah. At the beginning. <laughs> and the irony of you being on the far left. Yeah, and I'm not the far left of this guy either. <laughs> I, I, I have a number of potential questions, but I think the one that I, I want to ask, um, it may be really easy for you to, to address, is uh, you, you briefly mentioned, and I know you, you didn't hammer on this, so I'm not pushing it, the idea of the atheist ties to eugenics and genocide and things like that. Yeah. Um, and you made a, a point, I mean, I'm, we can have a long discussion about that, about that these things aren't necessarily tied to atheism. Um, but you mentioned that they're corrupted from the outside. Yeah. Now, I don't know, because we haven't talked, but slavery in the United States was supported by the Christian church, by Christian teachings, by biblical passages that explicitly say who you can enslave, how you can treat them, that they are in fact your property to be passed down. This entry into you know, the Christian Jewish tradition, essentially, um, is such that it supported slavery. Now, I don't know what your take is on whether that slavery, because you, you, you did something that confused me, because you went near a moral relativistic argument that what was wrong yesterday might not be wrong today. So I'm curious about your take on slavery. Was it once right? Was this God authorizing slavery? Um, was it right and became wrong? Was it always wrong and they just didn't recognize it? I wonder if you could just kind of give a quick take on that. Because from my perspective, slavery was an abomination that was actually corrected outside. It was one of the many things where I mentioned before that secular progressive ideas changed the way religious people thought about what was moral. Yeah, I think slavery was a vestige of, of pagan civilization. So tied in economically, it took years and years for people's thinking to even change, um, to recognize it as the sin that it was. The first, the first indication, the first real resistance against slavery is, is from the church fathers in, in the fourth century. St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil, and um, especially St. Gregory Nazianzus, who just said it was an evil institution. Okay, so that is what, that is what elevated people's moral reprehension of slavery, yet they still lived with um, slavery as an institution, okay? Um, it took another, well, you know, we had the Civil War, but I think slavery probably really ended with the Civil Rights Movement, let's say that, in the 60s, okay? That's when the institution of slavery, at least in the West, uh, really ended. I would say, see, there's, there's a, I agree with you that, 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 a lot of morality is discerned in, in confronting the difficulties of human life, okay? Um, a lot of times people have to wake up to the ultimate moral principle, so to speak, before, before the immorality of slavery is really written on the very fabric of the heart, you know, and, and before there's a, a moral reprehensibility that arises from that. It's true that, uh, that some Christians argued that slavery was um, you know, the will of God, but obviously they were wrong, okay? Just, it, 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 they were wrong, and other Christians challenged it. I would say, though, that the ultimate overthrow, overthrow of slavery 
was because of two things. Number one, the abolitionists. The abolitionists were the ones who overthrew slavery. The abolitionists grew up the Great Awakenings in, in uh, the uh, late 18th century, and then jumped the ocean, the, the Methodists, so on and so forth. I and mean, abolition was an exclusively Christian response to, to that crime. And I would say that the final chapter written during the Civil Rights Movement by Martin Luther King, read, read his speeches. They were thoroughly Christian in character and, and judged the discrimination against the black man in thoroughly Christian terms. So um, yeah, Christian culture, Christian culture carried a sin forward for many, many years. Some Christians were definitely wrong. But Christianity has, I argue, the atheism doesn't have this. Christianity has within it a self-correcting me mechanism in that it can judge its own sins. Now, whether people respond to the judgment and do what's right, they're individually free to do whatever they want. But, but it's there. And that's why I think, too, you have a, even a sense of, of, of moral progress in, in Western culture. I don't want to keep going. Did I go over Oh, that was a marvelous answer. Oh. And now, uh, Fairness, uh, you have an opportunity to, to make a, a question of some sort of math, and then we'll proceed to final closing. Okay. Um, I think, I, I've read the new atheists. I'm not that impressed with them. I think they're more polemical than anything else. And I was telling Matt, he didn't quite get this, so I'm going to talk about this for just a second. I think because we live in a post-Christian age, post-modern age, I think we also live in a post-polemical age. Polemics work when you share the same presuppositions. But we're in an age now where we, we, we operate from different presuppositions. Okay, so what I look for is what I call authenticity. And what I mean by authenticity, I go back to the existentialists who I love. I love the French existentialists. And I'll tell you why I love them. Because they recovered something from, from classical Christian culture that was lost, especially on the killing fields of World War I. You know, what happened among the philosophers and, and the deeper thinkers of the time is that the, the futility of World War I put an end to the death of the myth of progress. Okay, now, progress exists. Okay, linear time exists. Things have a beginning and an end. They didn't end in the pagan world. They do in the Christian world because, because the Western world redefined its conceptions according to the narrative of Genesis and not the narrative of the pagans. So what happened here, especially with the rise of materialism again, is that people had such faith in, in, in the natural human potential for progress that when World War I happened, they were hit with the sheer absurdity of the death of a generation of their best young men. And Europe collapsed exhausted. And out of that exhaustion arose the existentialists, and they say, we have to find our way back to meaning. And what they said was this. They said, man posits his own humanity through his moral actions. I love that, and I'll tell you why. Because they grasp, on a very secular level, but nevertheless true, that man's own sense of self as human and morality were closely, closely related. And so, see, I really get into the story and I forgot my point. Because I love that period. Where was I going with this? Story? I know it was. Oh, I was, yeah, 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 yeah. I know where I was going with this. Here, I saw you and I knew it. I respect, the truth was I really respect an authentic search for that which is true, even if a person denies God while he's doing it. Because if truth is a separate category, I'm making a speech here, but I'm going to finish it. If truth is a separate category of existence, you're going to end up there if your search is one search, not men, but one search is authentic. Okay. So, um, I forgot my point, I'm real sorry. But I, I get excited about World War I. So I get excited about the French existentialists that um, um, 
And I gotta say, Matt, what's what's going through my mind is I think your search is that. I really do believe it's that because um, you're not you're not willing to, to to dismiss the objection so easily. Here's my question that came back to me: gotcha. How do you deal with the fact that atheism as a philosophy, not you, Matt, atheism as a philosophy doesn't doesn't possess that self-corrective? Mechanism. Well, first of all, my response is that atheism, as I view it, isn't in fact a philosophy. It's not a worldview. It's an ideology. It's a single position on a single issue. And then everything else that I happen to believe is something else. My my atheism is a, a result of the fact that I have not present, been presented with any God concept that has been supported by sufficient evidence for me to believe it. I am a rational individual. I will change my mind based on evidence. I of the, well, this doesn't actually work in this case, but in many cases when I'm, when I'm talking to somebody and, and we're having an actually heated argument, which we're not, um, I'll point out that of the two of us, I'm the only one who's demonstrated he can change his mind in, in a major, major way. I mean, not about like what you want for dinner. Um, my, my atheism is largely irrelevant. My disbelief in the God propositions is largely irrelevant. What I am, what I do believe, is what's relevant. The type of things that I care about, the values that I have, my search for truth, wherever it is, my and the criteria by which I'll accept propositions. That's what's important, which is why I'm a skeptic and a critical thinker and a you know, methodological naturalist as opposed to necessarily a philosophical naturalist, although there's potential there as well. Um, and so, as an end to kind of answering your question, in that I don't hold atheism as a philosophy. Uh, my, my philosophical positions, I don't even know if they fit in a category. In some cases, I'm a secular humanist. In some cases, uh, you know, I'm a materialist. In some cases, I'm a naturalist. I, I don't know that there's necessarily one category for me. Um, but I do know that what I attempt to do well, when, I'm, when I have callers calling to the show, I don't define God and then tell them what I don't believe in. That would be crazy. I want them to tell me, whatever it is, whether it's God or you know reptilian aliens who are trying to take over the planet, tell me whatever it is that you believe and why you believe it. The why is important. Because I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. Now, there must be, in order for this to be viable at all, a method that provides the most reliable results at discerning this truth, at, at coming to as many true answers and as few false answers as possible. As near as I can tell, reason, the skeptical application of critical thinking, the evaluation of evidence with respect to standards, is the single most demonstrably reliable path to truth. Um, in conversations with other people, it would you know, well identify different presuppositions, but in many cases, they'll simply make an appeal to faith, which can have no leverage with me, because there's no reliable path of truth there. And what I'm advocating in the, in the secular moral system is that it does, the secular moral system does have a checks and balances, because there is, it is built around a demonstrable, open path to truth. What, I, what I'm curious and kind of in my response as a question to you is, clearly you seem to accept reason, you don't have any problem with logic and reasoning. Is there a discernible path to truth that is open to everybody within your paradigm, or does it require faith and individual direct revelation, that type of thing? Because if I don't understand how somebody can assert any kind of truth without a demonstration of that truth. And that demonstration has to be open to anybody. And that, that is kind of how we define reality. It's by the reality is the stuff doesn't go away when one of us close their eyes, you know, or one of us stops believing. So what discernible path of truth is there in, for example, the Christian worldview? The reality is the stuff doesn't go away when one of us close their eyes, you know, or one of us stops believing. So what discernible path of truth is there in, for example, the Christian worldview? So you're asking me, see, I have a discernible path. You're asking me how I'm asking how you can prove God, I guess. It's kind of a key. You can't, you can't prove God. Yeah, you're telling me how do I know what's, how does one know that he thinks is true is really true? 
Let me, let me, let me rephrase it then. If you, you are admittedly or acknowledging that you believe in something that's not necessarily demonstrably true. Well, not something that's not necessarily quantifiable. It's a difference. Well, then I don't know if I can rephrase the question because the, 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 the issue is I use reason as a path to truth. And it, it seems that you're using reason plus. And I don't mean that in, in the positive way. If you find something added, you, you are injecting something additional. And I wonder what that is and why you feel it's justified. Yeah, it's because it's necessary. Because, because um, so you're thinking in, in, this is what's hard. You're thinking in, in, in both the fundamentalist and, and, and the Catholic classic, classic categories. Okay, and, and I don't buy into those. I really don't. I, I look at, at the apprehension of truth. Okay, let's call it that. Okay, how does one find truth? Okay, it's certainly reason. I mean, you use your mind. But there is much in life that reason, you use your reason to maybe describe, but reason itself can't capture. Notions of justice, notions of beauty, the essence of meaning, okay? And, and those are things that, that are certainly reasonable, I mean, subject to reason, so to speak, but they are also broader than the categories of reason can possess. That's, for example, why we have music. Okay, what is music? Is music reason? No, it's not. But is music reasonable? Yes. But it transcends the very categories of reason because it can communicate. It communicates something greater than the categories of reason themselves can possess. It's not unreasonable. It's part of reason. But if we were to reduce the color and the narrative and the story of a musical piece just to reasonable categories, we'd be missing. The entire message. That's what I mean. Okay. Okay. Well, that was a fascinating exchange, and perhaps in the concluding remarks it'll continue, but each side now has uh, five minutes for wrapping whatever bow they would like to put on this, and then we'll proceed to open questioning. Uh, Matt gets five minutes for closing. Yeah, and again, I'll, I'll take it survey last in part because I, I want to get to the other questions. Um, it seems that there's a great many things we agree on. One of my goals is to try and figure out where we agree and where we disagree and why. I don't know that we can get there. I can, I can tell you why. I, I, and, and hopefully, you will. it seems that there are many things that we, we agree on. And, and I heard you say at one point that you don't have any problem with the idea that atheists can discern morality through a different source than what you do. And so it seems that while I'm saying um, the source of morality is reason, you're advocating a reason plus, or a reason and some other word, or an amplifier. I don't know. I'll let you get to that when you when you get to it. Um, my thing is, and, and this goes to my general um, inability to comprehend why people consider faith to be a virtue. Um, and, and I don't necessarily know that we're in disagreement here because I'm not as familiar with uh, orthodoxy, but to me, Reason is it. I mean, when it comes to discerning the truth, it's all you have to go on. You can only comprehend what you can comprehend. Your limits are there. And that's the reason we, we use it for everything. It's the reason we have discussions. It's the reason we set up debates. And I've used the word reason for reason four times. It's it. And what we also know is that when people propose alternate paths to truth, alternate paths of discernment, they cannot reliably demonstrate consistent results. We see this in the fact that there are hundreds of religions, thousands of denominations, and schisms all over the place, um, which, you know, if we were having a different debate on, on the nature of, of God and, and religion, um, I'm sure he and I would agree on even more things. And the one thing that, because generally speaking, we both reject every God that's ever been proposed except for one. My rejection is based on this, uh, in part, on this idea that until it's reasonably demonstrated, I can't see it. 
faith is not a reliable pathway to truth. And we know that the secular moral system is, in fact, superior, both in that it necessarily has the interests of the participants in mind, it is internal, it is built on self-correction, it is its entire purpose is to build a, a system that checks itself. It's not easy. Sam Harris lately has been referring to human well-being as the pinnacle goal. Um, and I happen to completely agree with it. Reading read Sam's book, it was like, yes, I've been saying this, but I didn't have the language. And he's been called on the carpet for you know, the nebulous nature of, of well-being, when, and his answer is to tie it to health. And I highly recommend that anybody who's interested in the subject, regardless of where you sit in the spectrum, it's a good book that will make you think. And I, and I hope that we've both done that as well. But we need to show the people who are adopting these secular positions that to stop. <laughs> the goal of secular morality. The chair, the chair grants an additional minute. Yeah. The goals of secular. Okay, one minute. I can I can kill this in a minute. <laughs> we need to show people that they don't have to be stealth secularists. They can actually join in and participate. They can be proud of their participation, and they can directly benefit from their contributions rather than standing in opposition to the very values they secretly embrace. Secular moral systems are inclusive. The authority comes from within. The focus is improvement. Based on our interest in the authority is based directly on a demonstration that the results meet the goals. We need to make, not make any appeals to the unknown. We are intelligent, empathetic, compassionate beings. We have the ability to set goals and solve problems. The fact that we're not perfect yet doesn't cripple us. It drives us. Because the goal of secular morality include the goal of getting better at getting better. What's that final statement? Um, see, you're not true to, not, not completely true to your, to the, not yours, but the atheist presuppositions. Your atheism is a kinder, gentler atheism than many of the new atheists. It is. It is. But that's because there's notions of, of, of moral progress and also there's there's also an eschatological vision that it can end up in a better place, which I say is a borrowing from Christianity. But I also say, not necessarily of Matt here, but of the atheist project also portends some great danger. Um, secularism, secularism as I define it, is, is nothing more than a blindness to the sacred dimension of life. Now Matt says everything has to be reasonable. I argue that truth really doesn't come to you through the categories of logic. It comes to you through beauty. It comes to you through reading fiction, especially literature. You know, the irony is that fiction, good fiction, is generally truer than nonfiction, isn't it? Because it reaches deeper truths. It comes to you through music. And this is one of the dangers of the profaning of our culture. You know, every place, I was, I was in Borders, actually preparing for this, and they had a whole thing of Madonna thought songs on. I said, please, please, it only takes so much. Right? But it's a profaning of culture. It really is. You know, and, and, and it's just a slow leveling. And so we lose the magnanimous beauty of human creativity. And it's human creativity that the essential truths come through. Now, granted, it's a messy project. I have no argument with that. And because there's people disagree on what is true and what isn't, I just say that's all part of the mix. If we believe in truth as a universal category, truth can emerge as long as people hold that presupposition in common and they're men and women of goodwill. I think you are. And I think you hold that fundamental presupposition in spite of your atheism. Okay? I do. I really do. Um, the new atheists don't, though. And the radical atheists don't either. And this is why secularism is something that I don't see as liberation. Okay? I see as 
potentially dangerous. To my eye, secularism defined as, as the elimination or the negation of the sacred dimension of life, and all of life has a sacred character, will, in the end, in historical terms, I'm making a projection here, prove to be nothing more than a layover from one city to the next. And that's what I worry about. Okay? Secularism, it appears to be a road of, of freedom, and it's presented that way. I'm not so sure it's a, it is. I worry that it's going to end up in tyranny. Why do I point to this? I'm not holding Matt responsible for this. I'm not holding all atheists responsible to this. But the atheist project, you know, from the 1900s forward, has been a bloody one. A very, very bloody one. And the historical record is not kind to it. So if secularism leads us to a new city, a new Jerusalem of sorts, where, where human sensitivity has been reduced to raw logic, and the belief, the belief, okay, not the proof, the belief that man, men and women are nothing more than the molecules that make up their brain, then this vision, this world vision, where truth comes through the flourishing of human creativity and human beauty and human language and the architecture and the music and the literature, it will be lost. It will be lost because that kind of human flourishing, that kind of human creativity ultimately, ultimately has its source and origin in the living God and all of us, I'm speaking as a Christian, all of us were created by him to share in that life and our fulfillment is to express that community in our particular human, personal distinctiveness. That's lost. That's the vision that is lost in secularism. And the historical record, as I said, shows that secularism, the denial of that sacred dimension, is a place that leads, in the end, to concentration camps and gulags. It does. Read your history. Read for questions your, and answers is not started. Read your history. I, I, I'll close with this. I said, I said that, that this is one of the fundamental questions of our age. If you want to read of this in um, more specificity, read the new philosophers, the French, the new French philosophers, Andre Glucksmann, Bernard Henry Levy, especially read his book, Barbarism with the Human Face. This is being talked about on very, very high levels. Hitchens knows this. And this is what he's arguing against. Popular, popular atheism, even popular Christianity, doesn't. But understand, understand that, that much is at stake here and one of the things is at stake is the very light that has enlightened Western culture as imperfectively as man has seen and perceived that light. But if that goes out, if that is extinguished, then we face a very, very dangerous future indeed. But questioners, you understand that you're being reported, all right? Well then, let's proceed. Uh, my role is simple. I'm going to start on this side uh, a question, and then we'll proceed to a question from this side, and simply uh, bounce back and forth. So with that, is your microphone on and working? We can hear you. Great. Go ahead, please, and make it brief. We have many questions. Sure. This is addressed to both speakers. I understand that you don't like Madonna. I don't either, but please just don't tell her stuff. Anyhow. My understanding of logic dictates that one cannot claim knowledge of 
or knowledge against a deity. With this in mind, do either of you feel that you have closed yourself from having certain beliefs of yours challenged in your thought process? Who wants to go first? John, as your uh, The father may go first this time. Okay. Um, repeat the question, please. <laughs> With the idea in mind that logic does not allow one to claim absolute knowledge for or against the subject of a deity existing, do either of you feel that you have closed certain aspects of your beliefs from being challenged in your thought process. So there are certain questions that come up in your mind that you refuse to address. No. No. Not at all. I mean, frankly, no. Why would it? You're saying, why would why would belief in God, what you're saying, what you're implying here is a, a, a belief in God would suspend what? Logic? Reason? Well, this, is, this really isn't a matter of a dialogue. Perhaps our atheists could... Uh, I would say no. Of course, no. Why would it? I'll say no and, and explain a little bit. You specifically said absolute knowledge, which, I mean, I think you're talking... I think you mean... I think that you mean that you're talking about absolute certainty. Um, and I'm not professing absolute certainty towards anything. Um, or almost anything. But I wish you could draw a diagram. Actually, I'll just point you to my lecture on belief. Because... This isn't a matter. It is, it is a fact that either a God exists or a God does not exist. Those are the only two possibilities. But what you believe about those two possibilities is a belief position with regard to two independent claims. It's the same way the example that I've often used is guilt and innocence. It is a fact that the defendant is always either guilty or innocent. But you can believe he's guilty, you can believe he's not guilty. And not guilty does not necessarily mean that you believe he's innocent. You can believe he's innocent, you can believe he's not innocent. The burden of proof we've established is such that you define this. This is kind of philosophical meat. But the key here is that what we're talking about is belief, not absolute certainty. I haven't closed myself off to anything and wouldn't. The next question, please. I had a different question, but uh, based on how the ending went there, I figured I'd go with this instead. Um, there's a Godwin's Law, I think it's called, where a conversation goes the closer it gets to Hitler being a book. So, um, just just with Hitler in mind here, um, I I looked this up on Wikipedia, so you can say it's not true if you want. It's not uh, a debate until so somebody so, brings up Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> so, here's, here's a quote, uh, just as, as really quickly if I can, and then the question. Uh, uh, hmm. Hitler's biographer, John Toland, uh, said that he was a member in good standing of the Church of Rome. And in Mein Kampf, he refers to the creator of the universe. He expressed a belief in one providential active deity. And here's one of his quotes, or not a quote from him, but he says that he believed that the Aryan race was created by God, and that it would be a sin to dilute it through racial intermixing. Um, with, with these things in mind, would you reconsider ever maybe not using you know, the idea that atheism was at least the cause of uh, you know, the Third Reich and all that. No, actually, for me, historic and historical terms, I know about this period, because I might touch on why a little later. Um, no, I, it, it's the eugenics, Hitler's racial eugenics. Do you know where they came from? Uh, no, not the oh, yeah. United States. Do you know who... Um, you know, the SS was so efficient in rounding up Jews from the different cities that they had to have some kind of informational methodology in order to separate them from the Germans. Do you know who gave that technology to them? IBM. IBM, you're correct. Hitler's racial ideology was an import from America, very popular. It, it led to the Tuskegee experience, uh, experiments, you've heard about that, okay? And that was actually a, a uh, outgrowth of Darwinian science applied to sociology, okay? And you have the rise of Marcus Sanger and everybody. That's where he got his racialist ideology from. Now, in religious terms, what happened was, with the, the suppressing of, 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 of Christianity, it's a big, big historical reasons for that, you had the reemergence here of the Teutonic myth, 
And that's where Aryan supremacy came from. That's where you had the whole ideology of Leibniz round. You had the Anschluss then and the, the uh, attack on Poland. And ultimately, you have to ask this question, why did he go after the Jews? Why? Okay. Now, this, this is one of the central questions historians ask us a lot. Perhaps it can be made briefly so the atheists is a good answer. So. Oh, OK, OK. Um, because the, the Jew, by his very person, because he represented the singular God of Abraham, became an enemy then of this, this, this atheist eugenic program. Go ahead, man. We probably can't have a beer. Um, I'll, do, I'll, I'll, I'll do this quick, and I'm only half joking. Um, I think a lot of people have probably shown on the video to, to see the ending of this, bring this up. Um, atheism doesn't lead to anything. Secularism doesn't lead to anything. We do not take actions based on what we don't believe. Hitler acted on the basis of an ideology, an ideology that was very much like religion in the way that it was done. Hitler's troops ran around with got mittens on their belt buckles. He professed that he was doing this for his Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I don't know what his beliefs were with regard to religion, and I don't care. Um, it doesn't matter to me whether he was a closet atheist, a closet Satanist, um, whatever. The fact of the matter is he did not take these actions on behalf of atheism or secularism. secularism and it is patently offensive and absurd to insinuate otherwise, especially as opposed to the The reasons why those actions got taken can be the subject of much debate. It's, it's not an issue. It's just... Uh, I, I'm, I'm done with it. Let's go. <laughs> What about Soviet communism? You're that not was atheistic. Quiet. <laughs> this gentleman has the floor. Uh, going a little farther back in the debate, you had mentioned uh, Christianity as having a self-correcting mechanism. Yeah. With Christianity basing most of their belief off of the Bible, which is supposed to be the infallible word of God, do you propose that when slavery was corrected later on, that Christianity corrected God, and the fact that it appears in the Bible? and is very laid out on how to execute slavery, that you would propose to know better than God on how to correct something like that? Or are we wrong and God's right on the fact that, well, he says slavery is okay, so then it should be? Well, your, your question is premised on the scriptures being the infallible word of God, okay? That's a fundamentalist category. I don't hold to infallibility. Okay, remember I said that I think that truth enters the world, the word, the world through a word, through narrative. I think that that story is the most powerful thing in existence. That's what shapes our reality. Whether or not something is infallible, it has no meaning for me. Okay, infallibility. See, I think truth, and this is why I don't want to reduce it strictly to rationalist categories. That's not to say that. Truth is unreasonable, it's not. Truth fills reason, but I think it exceeds those categories. To say that something is infallible, infallible is to say it's something is not true unless it passes a particular criteria established over here. I don't think that's how it works. I think, I think truth ultimately is its own verification. Because truth, in order to be true, has no appeal higher than itself, okay? So, so Matt asks, well, how do you know what the truth is? I think that truth is not only seeing, uh, you know, that something is, it, it, it's not syllogistic, okay? It's, it's not something, it's not something that one plus one equals two. It's something that also calls forth other super rational reactions in us, humility, patience, things like that. The encounter with truth, because I think that truth is a person, ultimately, is a very personal 
experience. And that's why you can't put it under a microscope, and that's why I would never say I can prove God to you. I can't. He's not quantifiable. And that's, uh, he, it, it's more, it's, it's more, it, it, it really comes through in the, in the very harsh and difficult circumstances of, 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 of human existence, which is why I think the creative categories are much more effective in, communi in communicating the, 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 the existential truths that exist outside of the empirical categories to us. Matt, would you like uh, to have that as well? Or? No, it's, it's, it's okay. This question is started about the literal idea of slavery. He doesn't subtract the literal view of it, so no, very good. Uh, next question, please. Would it be appropriate if I, sorry. <clears throat> Would it be appropriate if I asked Mr. Delhaney a question about a show of his experience? Uh, if, if it's about uh, you know the, the issues at hand tonight, it's but if it's uh, about the show in general, I'll have to. It's decline. quick, but it doesn't have anything to do. I better sit down. <laughs> Ask me afterwards. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, well, well, let's have this microphone have a chance. Go ahead, uh, Father Hans. I have um, a question about interpretation of scripture. Um, you are not a biblical literate, so um, some parts of the Bible you take to be metaphorical, uh, like the talking snake, like Adam and Eve. Um, that Adam and Eve didn't actually exist, um, but they're a form of poetry. Uh, so then why can't you say the same for, for example, Jesus of Nazareth, that he did not exist, but he is a form of poetry? And by what means do you draw that distinction? How do you say, well, this is poetry, and this is real? Well, in, in speaking of Genesis, it's, it's written in pre-scientific times, so to read it as a scientific textbook is just anachronistic. And then if you know a little bit of Hebrew, and I do, you know, when you look at the names, you know, Adam stands for man, Eve stands for the mother of the living, they're obviously types. It's, it's typological, uh, a typological grammar, okay? And holding as I do, to the, the, the precept that narrative is, is, is the foundation of knowing. I look at it as a creation story. But having said that, I look at any story of the origins of creation as a creation story. Okay? So I look at the, 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 the other religions. I look at anything that purports to explain the beginnings as narrative. And then what I do is I look at the different narratives and I decide which is the more compelling, okay? Now, Jesus of Nazareth, okay, um, this part you're not gonna like, okay? I can't prove Jesus to you. I can't do it. But how do I know it's true? Because I've encountered the risen Christ. That's how I know. Okay, now, am I asking you to believe that? No. Can I prove it to you? No. All I can do is say that I have encountered the risen Christ and I met him on the road to Emmaus, so to speak. Actually, it was more like Saul. He had to slap me a couple times. Okay? That's all I can say. That's all I can say. But I can also say this. In historical terms of that, that testimony was so powerful, not mine, but 12 men known as the apostles. And then in the lives of others, that became the foundation of an entire civilization. Okay. It gave birth, it gave birth to science. You. Uh, since you're an atheist and you don't believe in God, uh, your starting point is, you know, uh, matter, time, and chance. You know, matter when you look at the primordial soup, uh, soup, you know, blah 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 blah, or you know, time is just ooh, ooh, as it's moving right now. Uh, having said that, uh, since it all is changing, truth as a category can't exist because what is true today, as time, matter, and and chance are changing, it can't be the same tomorrow. So, but you seem to believe in truth as a category does exist. 
Why do you say that? Because what's true right now is definitively true right now. It doesn't matter if it's not true tomorrow. It's true in that discrete measure, and therefore, in at least a metaphorical sense, truth exists. Whether it's con whether you want to say that it's conceptually, we conceive of it. But when, when I when I conceded that point about truth, what I'm saying is that uh, it, it goes back to logical absolutes. Whatever this is, that's what it is, and it's not something else, and it's not neither or both. And it is that at, at an instantaneous moment that you can't really define. It's it's. Um, so I have no problem at all with the idea that something is true, or that there may be a metaphorical category, a way of thinking about truth in which it becomes that kind of category. Is, is do I look at do I look at the universe and say, ah, oh, there's physical, conceptual, and truth? No, not really. Not as an extant thing. Is truth enduring? Is there is there in a category of enduring truth? I don't know. Because if you follow that through then the only conclusion you can come to is that all truth is relative. No, I don't know how that's the only conclusion you can come to. A rock is a rock. A what rock other conclusion is there? A rock is a rock irrespective of what anybody else thinks about it. And therefore, that is the truth that is not relative. The, you, you mentioned a couple times that atheism and materialism um, disregards this notion that there is any objectivity that it all becomes subjective, and that's not remotely true. The, the, the endeavor of science is to describe and understand the objective natural world to the best of our ability. There's no denial that you know Saturn exists. Um, and and that's, that same thing applies pretty much across the board. But, but the questions of the, the truth of morality, all the existence of morality, is not a question of empirical science. It's a question of values. It's a question of presuppositions. Now, if no enduring, no category of enduring truth exists, then morality by definition, by necessity, has to be relative. It's, it may be the case that there are scientific truths to be learned about morality, which is in part the case that Sam Harris is making. And it's part of what I'm saying. That if you think about it, in any particular situation, there are a number of possible actions. And some of them are better, and some of them are worse. Which means out of the pool, the finite pool of actions for this particular situation, there is a set, it may be a set of one, it may be a set of 50,000, that represent the pinnacle best moral action for that scenario. In that situation, that is objective. It is independent of each individual observer. But here's my problem with that. See, and I don't mean to be offensive, I really don't. Every time atheism tries to meld to meld morality with the system. I'm sorry I'm offensive. You're not, some people are not going to like this. It always ends up in more blood. You've never seen it. But you've seen, what you've seen are ideologies that were consistent, or perhaps the enforced position of there will be no religion. That is an ideology. It is consistent with, but not caused by atheism. If you're going to talk about cause, you need something that's both necessary and, and sufficient. And atheism is neither necessary nor sufficient to the type of ideology that ends up in gulags. Theoretically. Yeah, theoretically. See, the only, the only, the only, the only stand against the atheist program. I'm not saying all atheists are like this. Understand that. Well, it seems it. like nonsensical to say the atheist program because you're talking about something that doesn't exist. The, the, the grand ideologies of the last century have always been, been, been atheistic and th th therefore utopic in scope, okay? And the only thing that stands against them is an appeal to transcendent morality. Wow. Totalitarianism? That's the totalitarian. totalitarian. Now, I'm not saying all atheists are totalitarians. I'm saying totalitarianism is by necessity atheistic. And there is no, there is no stand against that except an appeal to transcendent and enduring truth. Really quickly, two, in like five seconds. Even if it was necessarily atheistic, atheism is not sufficient. You need both to determine a cause. And it's intellectually dishonest to assert cause absent both of those. I'm not saying that atheists will become totalitarian. I'm not saying that. I'm not making a judge. Hitler and Stalin both have mustaches. Now, now we're talking about correlation versus causation. The fact that something is correlated with something. Nazism and Marxism 
denies the transcendent character of the individual person. So do I. I know you do. I know you do. Well, That's why it's a fundamental question of our relationship. <laughs> so we have a side debate in addition to sidetrack this so we'll people. Uh, yes, please, next question. Father Jacobson, yeah. uh, since you don't presuppose materialism, how do you tell the difference between something that's immaterial and something that's imaginary? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. Sometimes, sometimes with, with, um, with, um, well, I, I'm thinking, see, see, ima imaginary. I mean, there's a, there's a pejorative, I, I hear what you're saying, there's a pejorative attached to it. But I think that human imagination is, a, is, is one of the tremendous gifts. I think, I think one of the things that, that um, and this needs to be developed in our theology, but in our anthropology, but one of the things that really shows that we are created in the image and likeness of God, I hold Genesis to be true, not literal, not historical, but true, is our natural aptitude for creativity, of taking the stuff of creation, words, clay, whatever, and refashioning it into something that's larger than we are. And that speaks to a truth greater than the, the, the arts possesses, right? So I see human imagination as, as, as uh, critical to, to, to human self-identity and, and, and also the, the awareness of man's own transcendence, okay? But that, that has to occur, and it, it will only occur if the notion that a transcendent truth exists because it calls man to reach outside of himself and to reach higher. Okay, so something can be imaginary, okay, but still very true. The novel of Dostoevsky's, for example, all the characters are imaginary, they never lived, but they're truer than, than life, okay? So the answer to the question then, really, I can't answer it with a yes or no. The answer to your question is really tied into your deeper notions of where truth lies and how to discover it. Part of the reason that our culture is so vulgarized these days is because the notion that transcendent truth is dimming, okay? And so what we have is we have pop culture that doesn't reach very deep, but it's very pervasive everywhere. But it's, it's simply not very good because it's not very deep. It's entertaining, but it's simply not very good. It doesn't tell us anything, okay? If it's deeper, and if it's, it's, these things are always, always learned and struggle, okay? Nothing, nothing in life, I'm old enough to know this now, nothing in life comes without some kind of suffering or some kind of conflict. It just doesn't, okay? But, but to say something then, something is imaginary, is not necessarily to degrade it. Again, it needs a judgment. Is that product of the imagination pointing to something that's deeper, that's truer, that's elevating us, or is it not? You make the judgment based on that criteria, and, and no other in my, in my view. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, uh, next question, please. Okay, my question is one of clarification. I noticed that, um, Father, you spoke of the self-correcting me mechanism that Christianity has, and I don't know if you, I don't know if I misunderstood, but you spoke about the um, flaw in atheism being that it can only relate from its own personal experience. Um, and then, Mr. Dillahunty, you spoke about um, the rational analysis of cause and effect um, and evaluating our decisions and then changing our beliefs as a result. So what I'm wondering is what is this self-correcting mechanism and why is cause, uh, what Mr. Dillahunty spoke of in terms of cause and effect not an appropriate self-correcting mechanism, and his personal experience, um, well, is the greater good not in line with some transcending personal experience? Because, because my presupposition is, is that morality is not quantifiable. It reaches into the deeper areas of human experience like creativity, like I just defined, okay? The self-correcting mechanism is this, is that a brave soul comes forward and says you're wrong, okay? 
And that's what happens. There's been times in Christianity when the majority of Christians were wrong about things. Okay? And this is especially true, I can speak of Orthodox history, where people have even been persecuted by the church. The problem in church, church, with the church is whenever it gets too closely aligned to the state, it gets in trouble. And it does things it should not do. Now, you always have people who, who stand up and say, no, wrong. Lots of times, those, those people even get persecuted by the church. Okay? But the next generation sees the rightness of their words, and it self-corrects. So the self-correction occurs because of, um, number one, the individual bravery of, of lone prophets, so to speak. But these lone prophets, it's just like... It's just like Martin Luther King. Okay? You know why he succeeded? Read his speeches. He was a lone prophet in, in American culture. You know why he succeeded? Because he called the deepest moral impulses from the people forward. And all his language, remember I said truth comes into the world through a word? All his his language drew so deeply from the moral, Christian moral tradition that those who heard had their consciences awakened and they changed their moral outlook towards the black man. That's how it works. That's the self-correcting mechanism. Because if morality is reference to to something beyond your individual experience, to an authority, to a category, whatever, higher than yourself, okay, then the appeal you bring forward, if true, rouses us the, the consciousness of people. Uh, we've seen that in the church, and we've seen it with Martin Luther King Jr. Okay. Uh, Matt, would you like a crack at uh, self-correcting? Yeah, um, on, the one, on the one hand, um, I see how from his perspective he can say that that's self-correcting. I don't necessarily see it as self-correcting because the correction came from outside of the orthodox view at the time. This would, you, know, it, it, you can make the claim that it's self-correcting if you assume that there is a uh, divine providence guiding these corrections. Um, but I would say that in a, in a secular moral system, we have, some, we have a clear clear path to self-correction, and that is that, let's say I'm a slave owner, you know, in, in the early United States, and it's clear that I have some preconception that I am better as a person, more valuable than the individual that's my slave. Otherwise, I would, I would immediately recognize the contradiction, immediately recognize that, oh wow. And it is this process by which the system evaluates the results that it produces to compare this value, I'm better, with my other values, which is, for example, I want to live in a world where well-being is considered, or now I have met an individual who would have ordinarily been a slave in, in my camp, and they have shown me a different aspect of their, of their nature, such that now this is in question. It has to be some correcting, because it's all-encompassing. Um, the mechanism is there, and the mechanism is reason and understanding. And not just reason, I mean, it's reason and an empathetic uh, position. Uh, the understanding that you are not the universe. And, and uh, Father Hans pointed out a minute ago that, um, I did, uh, did do it, Joanna, I'm sorry. Uh, that you need something higher than yourself, and, and, the, and the assertion is that, that secular views don't have something that, that's higher than themselves. And that's not necessarily true. I am not the penultimate authority on what is moral. I am the ultimate arbiter of what I consider to be moral. I can have my mind changed based on evidence. That is a self-correcting mechanism. But the thing that is higher than me are the values that I and my society, and, and it, it, I don't want to make it sound like it's relative because it's not just the society. The things we value, and we start with simple things, like the child, they're a death, et cetera. So when we find values in conflict, the results are what lead us back to correct those values. Very good. Uh, uh, first of all, Mr. Uh, Jacobsey, uh, you mentioned, well, 
obviously the, the Christian self-correcting principle and by implication that an atheist society or a secular society can't have that. And then you brought up the existentialists who basically fix society based on the horrors of World War One, and seeing what went wrong and I assume empathy for others and imagining what it would be like to be when we killed doughboys, blah, blah, blah. All of these, including the stuff that you attributed to Martin Luther King, are also all available to an atheist. Yes. So, what do we need a Christianity for? And if I may, I also have a question for Mr. Dillahunty and Mr. Shook. One, one question. Because, Please, please. because Martin Luther King was a Christian, and he would tell you that, that every precept that he awoken both Christian and atheist, the Christian and atheist conscious with, drew from the moral tradition. I would argue, I take a little farther, and I would say if the atheists won't agree with this, but but I think it's historically demonstrable that even the values of atheism draw from the Christian moral tradition. I addressed that earlier. All right, next question, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm a Muslim by religion, and uh, I believe that uh, we are spiritual beings having a human experience on this earth, and God has created us, and because God has created us, He has given us the purpose of life, how to live our life, and the morals, you know, what are the morals to follow in this life. So if those morals are eternal, whether someone was existent, in existence in uh, 300 BC, or will come, you know, seven or thousands of years later, you know, after us. So, uh, my are you saying that the moral is the same 300 years ago and 1,000 years from now? Thanks. Did you have a question for one of our debaters, please? Uh, so, what your proposition in the form of a question? So, what I'm trying to understand from Mr. Matt is that the reason is there in religion, but it's only in the implementation part. For example, today's society is very different from you know 700 years ago. So, implementation is where reason comes in. So, how, how can you say that? The reason is just limited to you know what, what you do today, and you can reason it today's ideas, but 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 not look at what has happened in the past and 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 what is to come in the future. And how I mean, because the morals will change based on based on reasoning. Morals will change from person to person and society to society. Sure, I, I didn't say that we only consider reason now and we don't consider the past. What I'm saying is that, for example, slavery was always immoral. It's just that the people did not recognize it because they had a value that was in conflict with it. Um, on your, it, it, it's, it, that's just the way it is. It, it was a discovery. It was a, 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 a learned thing that, hey, we've been doing something wrong. It, it is necessarily wrong, is what I'm, what I'm saying. Your, your, your position about a religion that teaches everything good from the get-go, um, find that one. Um, I'm following one. <laughs> okay. Um, and as soon as you can actually demonstrate the truth of that permanent good, then I say that you found Would you accept the moral truth. But it's the, the, the fact that you have to demonstrate it <laughs> independent of a you know, piece of faith. It, it is demonstrated by its effective good. And the fact that you found a truth does not in any way testify to the source that is being proposed for that truth. Any more than if I guessed heads on a coin flip proves that I'm psychic. There's a difference between this exists and this is its cause. And there needs to be a causal link to find there. So while I would laud any religion that had a perfectly good set of morals, and I don't, no offense to you, but I don't think any of them exist. I don't think any secular moral system is, I don't, I don't even know that it's possible to get it all right. And Sam Harris re relates the idea of well-being that we use for morals to health. We don't have a perfect understanding of what health is. That doesn't mean that we throw up our hands and say, well, we don't know whether drinking battery acid is better than drinking milk. We do. Um, and the idea, for example, in I, I like immorality to a strategy of a game. The physical reality that we inhabit, and I'm way over a minute. I like the morality of the strategy of the game, and the fact that we don't necessarily have a perfect strategy doesn't mean we don't have ideas about what's better than others, and it doesn't mean we throw up our hands and give up. So, I mean, if you want, you can email me and tell me about the perfectly good, you know, uh, sure, moral like views of, of Islam. I'll have sure, it's 
president at atheist-community.org. Do you have a card on Sunday? I didn't bring cards, but okay. and you can I'll, I'll give you the address. I'll be right afterwards. Okay, thank you. Very good. Next question, please. Right, uh, this question to the Father. Um, uh, you, you you said earlier that uh, reason can lead to morality, but you, but still you said it's not completely that. You said that there the, there's the extra thing like you mentioned um, beauty and music that cannot be explained by reason. But how do how do how does how do uh, music and beauty actually help you shaping your morality? And can and if they if they can't can people be uh, moral without this extra thing other than the reason? I would say I'd say the re the way that works is is that music good music um, whatever the higher things if you will the things that, that seek to penetrate more deeply into the nature of reality make you more human okay um, if you are reading literature over say watching pornography okay you're going to be a different person at the end of the book okay if you read if you read Dostoevsky again or any good novel you spend 10 hours a week doing that versus 10 hours a week watching porn on your computer okay at the end of the week you're going to be a different person okay and and I believe that that and I live my life this way, and I believe it because I believe it's true. And as I said before, the fact I believe it does not make it true. Okay? It's true. That's why I believe it. Is that man is fundamentally, before all things, a spiritual being. Okay? He's also a material being. But I, in, I repudiate I'm not, I just don't implicitly reject, I repudiate the claim he is nothing more than his molecules. I say that every man, whether you believe this or not, every man and woman alive, whether you believe this or not, has some spark of divinity in him. That spark is defined in my narrative text that shapes how I view things as the very breath of God. That we are both created out of the dust of the ground, but we also possess his breath in some ways. The narrative tells us man became a living soul. And that, that very reality calls you upward, higher. And when we look at history, when that is recognized and understood, you see the great developments in science, art, architecture. That is its source, and that is its motivation. So, what are we going to be? Are we going to be someone who disciplines ourselves and reads the good stuff? Or are we just going to glue our screens to our computer and watch porn for the rest of our life? Okay? I'm telling you, you guys, because I know you all do it. I know you all do it. In the end, in the end, listen to me. In the end, you're going to become more of an animal and less of an angel. Because you're denying something fundamentally true about yourself. No, 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 this is not a dialogue opportunity. Next question, please. And let's uh, accelerate the, the Q&A a bit. We're approaching the, the uh, time stop, I'm afraid. Um, Michael Shermer wrote a, a book called The Science of Good and Evil. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, uh, yes. but it posits that basically uh, evolution uh, favors individuals and, and cultures that are uh, more moral than, than others. Uh, and uh, I guess, Matt, what's your, what is your thought on, on that hypothesis? And uh, as far as the father is concerned, uh, if you do believe evolution... We have time for one question. Okay. Thank you, Matt. I agree. <laughs> So I believe that the Darwinian narrative of creation 
is the creation narrative of the philosophical materials. Next question, please. Uh, this one is for you. Uh, I, I have a question. About, you said earlier um, that uh, God produces creativity in man, um, more or less. Uh, however, there are a lot of artists, writers, and musicians or atheists. Gordon yeah. Dell being one of them. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how you would reconcile that or think okay. that. Yeah. Um, I would say that the natural creativity with man is congruent with the nature, well, we don't know the nature of God, we only know his person. Okay? We don't know anything about God's nature. Is congruent with the person of God as He's revealed to us in both the sacred text and and uh, you know the Muslim would agree with me on that by the way he would agree with me um, um, in in the sacred text of, of, of Christian scripture but also through the work and witnesses of other people okay I think that that creativity exists and is not dependent on one's belief in God it exists despite one's belief or or non-belief in God. Um, some things are beyond the scope of logical demonstrability. In fact, much of life is. Much of life really is. Human creativity is a construct, construct we all understand, but you can't stick it under a microscope. You only recognize it by its fruit, what it produces. And it's full of meaning, even if it says there is no meaning. Okay? That itself is meaningful. Okay? Uh, great. Uh, time for two more questions. Please go ahead. I'll keep mine simple. Uh, how would you define faith? And how would you then apply that? And where do you place your faith? That's directed to both of you. Thank you. Um, I've gone back and forth on different definitions of faith. Um, because it seems to be used in so many different ways. Generally, in my interactions with people, and this may not be representative of everybody because we already know that I'm coming from a more uh, Southern Baptist Protestant background, I, I tend to define faith as the excuse people give for believing something when they don't have a good reason. And I have no use for it at all. Faith, since it came into existence 2,000 years ago, it's in the, in the New Testament of the Scriptures, I can find it in this, in, in this cultural context which helps me understand what it means today. Okay? Faith, the Apostle Paul defines it as the evidence of things hoped for, um, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now you have to realize that he wrote that in the midst of a pagan culture who that could only offer one of two things, fate or cosmic despair, okay? It's the only options you had under pagan culture, all right? You, either, you were either subject to the vicissitudes of fate, or if you were a deeper thinker, you were, all you had was cosmic despair because there was no order, there was no discernible order to the universe. Discernible, discernible order to the universe only came to, into existence as, as the as Greek thought was synthesized with Judaic thought in the, in the, through the gospel, in, Christians, in Christian thought, because what it did was, was it, it placed man at a different point, number one, in the universe, and it defined the universe in, 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 in a different way, which I alluded to earlier, which means that it, that, that it has a beginning and an end. Okay, I don't know how far I want to go with this. It, the notion that time and space are created is an exclusively Christian contribution to the history of human thought. Okay, once that became established, the notion of progress became possible. Consequently, faith gets redefined in the present in the present age because we no longer face cosmic despair and we no longer face fate. Even, even the atheists don't. This is a debt that they owe to Christianity. So faith is what? Faith is recognizing that life indeed does have a spiritual dimension and that even if something is not quantifiable, it still can be true. In other words, faith, in, in, I think in the modern definition, is this. 
things don't have to be solely material to be true. Truth exists not distinct from, but, but it incorporates materiality, but also exceeds beyond the categories of materiality. And it's just the recognition that life does indeed have a spiritual dimension. Now, what that spiritual dimension is, we can debate. And many people do, and they will till the end of time. But, but it recognizes that, as I said, truth cannot be reduced to just what you see under a microscope. Well, it is nevertheless true that I promised one more question. Everybody else in line, sorry, but stick around because after this, we will reconvene with the panel to continue discussing these issues, and there will be more opportunity for question and answer. Please, one last question. Hi. My question is for you, Matt. Um, earlier you said, we have a brain, morality is a truth to be discovered, not a rule to follow. Now, um, it's common Christian belief... You said a rule to be disseminated. Rule to be disseminated. I'm sorry, I was right sorry. fast. I, I'm, I'm a fan of alliteration, so I worked on that actual bit. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Alright, well nevertheless, it's a common Christian belief that God gave us free will. So with that free will, we have the choice whether or not to seek His truth or seek another worldly truth. My question is, for you, how does how do you discern where that search comes from? Because for, for a Christian, you would say, I get that, the desire to seek that truth from God. So I'm wondering where you would say it comes from. And I would where say, does the desire to seek truth come from? Right, and I would say that if you say human nature, there's no more evidence for that than there is for God. No, this my personal search for truth is something that is personal experience for me. I don't know if anybody else has this. Um, I see evidence of other people doing the same thing. Um, I have no problem at all saying that I think we both agree that it's part of human nature. It's just that one of us is saying that it's part of human nature because it's part of God's nature, because it's part of what God wants human nature to be. Mm -hmm. I don't see a justification for adding that additional thing. It's like saying um, we both agree that the universe had a beginning. I don't know what the beginning is. And those people who are claiming that they do know, I don't see their evidence. I don't see their rational justification for this. So while it's in my nature to, to seek truth and be inquisitive, um, if it comes from sort, some source of external me, I have no idea. Uh, I don't see any reason why it should. How could that be free will if it was coming from somewhere else? But anyway, free will is a big kettle of fish to get into. Oh, no, let's not go there. Please, help me thank our debaters.